We all know the common image of interwar Japan, a paranoid, militaristic and nationalistic state seeking to strike out and dominate all of Asia, leading it down the track towards conflicts with most of their neighbors, committing atrocious atrocities along the way as it competed with Germany and the Soviet Union for which nation could be the most horrific one of the era. But Japan didn't always have to be this way. During the Taisho period, Japan had a vibrant period of democratic rule, while on the world stage, Japan made attempts to keep the peace. They participated in the Washington Naval Treaty and the League of Nations, and relations with the Western powers were cordial. Japan had already built a quite nice little empire, conquering Korea, Taiwan, and a bunch of Pacific Islands. But all of this came crashing down during the Showa period, as Emperor Showa, better known in the West as Hirohito, oversaw a period of declining democracy as militaristic and reactionary forces increasingly took hold of the nation, greatly assisted by the Great Depression and increasing American tariffs that came with it, crashing the Japanese economy and playing up Japanese insecurities towards the West. Under all of these issues, the nationalists and the militarists radicalized even further, as coups and assassinations began to rock the nation, with the perpetrators of such coups rarely punished. Meanwhile, the army was going on adventures across Asia without the permission from the civilian government, like setting up a puppet regime in Manchuria, interfering with China's attempts to reunify, and even skirmishing with the Chinese in Shanghai. This increasing militarism would eventually lead to the full invasion of China, the rest of Asia, two atomic bombs and the creation of anime. But this leaves the question, what if Japanese democracy had survived into the 30s and 40s? So let's start by meeting Japan during the Taisho period. While not a perfect democracy, it was a liberalizing state, based on the British model, with seeming ever-increasing liberalism, expanding voting rights and a growing middle class, which gave Japan a vibrant urban culture, much like in Weimar Germany or the US at the time. But there were also deep-rooted insecurities held by the Japanese. It's crazy to realize that during the start of the Taisho period, Japan had only been open to the world for less than 60 years. Before that time, Japan was ruled by nobles and samurai, two groups which massively lost out in wealth and influence from the opening up of Japan and the increasing industrialization and modernization that came with it. This led to these old elites developing a hatred towards the West, whom they saw as having destroyed Japan as it should be. Coupled with this was dissatisfaction with the new democratic government of Japan. Only one institution in the nation was still seen as honorable, the military. So, the sons and the grandsons of these disgruntled elites gathered together in the military academies, and the army increasingly became an institution hostile to the very government it was supposed to be a party of. If we want democracy in Japan to survive, there's only one culprit that we need to curtail, the military. That doesn't mean that there weren't other very important factors, like the economic recession, which most certainly contributed to the spread and even acceptance of the ideas that the military was propagandizing, but above all else, it had been the military that served as a center point, the jukebox for these ideas, tearing down Japan's democracy from inside. A major blow to Japanese democracy came with the invasion of Manchuria. This was an act done entirely by the army, with Japan's government and emperor opposing the invasion, but being unable to stop it. Since the government didn't support the invasion, they also wanted no part in the governance of this state. This would lead to Manchuria becoming a state dominated by the Japanese military, a sort of test run of how the military would want all of Japan to be. This occupation of Manchuria was massively popular with the Japanese public. During a time of crisis, the army had just seized a massive amount of territory, and the army began undermining the government even further after this, as political assassinations and coup attempts began to rock the nation. But despite this, democracy was not dead. Japan didn't have a Germany situation, where the population voted the ultranationalists into power. In the 1936 election, the military aligned party got less than 4% of the votes. Japan didn't vote ultranationalism into power, and without the military being able to act so autonomously, I have very high faith that the Japanese democracy could have survived. Hey, sorry for the quick intermission, but by far most of you aren't subscribed. If you like the content, consider doing so. Thank you. So, how do we reign in the army? Well, we need to have the emperor, as well as the civilian government, make consistent stands against the demands of the military. 
For example, under the Meiji constitution, the army and navy ministers of the empire had to be serving army generals or admirals of the imperial army and navy. This led to a constitutional crisis in 1912, when first the army and then the navy simply refused to appoint ministers until their demands were met. Rather than resolving the issue, the prime minister resigned, sending the explicit message to the army and the navy that they could collapse the civilian government via blackmail just by refusing to supply ministers. It's in crises like these, where the military is testing the government, all three emperors of the time, Meiji, Taisho and Showa, all need to oppose the military if they are being unreasonable. Another example of this was during the first Sino-Japanese War and then the later Russo-Japanese War. During the Sino-Japanese War, the army attempted to ban the Prime Minister from attending war meetings. Emperor Meiji would force the army to admit the Prime Minister anyways. In 1904, during the Russo-Japanese War, the army tried the same thing, but this time Meiji failed to intervene and the Prime Minister was indeed barred from entering. This is another matter where the emperor and civilian government need to put their foot down to ensure civilian oversight over the army. Again, all three emperors need to consistently back the civilian government against the army to curtail their autonomy and ego. Alternatively, we could have the new western-influenced Japanese government work harder to not alienate the former rural elites, ensuring that they keep their prestige and wealth in this new system, at least to some extent. This could never be fully done however, and would put a damper on Japanese modernization, but it would slightly de-radicalize the den of extremism that was the imperial Japanese army. Now you may think, but this surely isn't enough to kill the specter of militarism and nationalism in Japan. You're right, and that isn't my goal. We could just pile on reform after reform, give Japan a better economy, improved politics, a more responsible population, etc etc. But at that point, we could have just replaced Japan with Britain too. I want to change as little as possible to keep realism and the spirit of Japan at the time as intact as possible. Which leads us to the Great Recession. The American economy collapsed at a time when Japan's economy already had it tough, suffering from the Showa financial depression. Global trade then took a major hit, especially as the US, Japan's foremost trading partner, put tariffs on foreign nations, including Japan. The US was such a massive market for Japan, they accounted for more than half of Japanese exports, so American tariffs hit Japan especially hard. And this severe economic downturn would be the start of the downfall of Japanese democracy in our timeline, spearheaded by the invasion of Manchuria. If the civilian government, over the decades, had ensured control over the military, or at least enough that they cannot illegally invade an entire country, we can prevent the rising culture of militarism, nationalism, assassinations and coups like in our timeline. These would still be tough times for Japanese democracy, with radicalism abound, civil violence, the military testing their limits, and even still, assassinations and coups, these would all still happen. But like I said before, the military got less than 4% of the votes, with the military more subdued and Showa being a vocal supporter of civilian rule, I have no doubt that Japanese democracy could keep functioning into the late 30s. And we all know what that means, World War II, which would be radically changed. In Europe and Africa, Germany still tries to do the same thing, taking charge of much of the continent and invading the Soviet Union, but there are a couple of major shifts. Air, land and naval assets from Asia, as well as resources, can keep flowing from British Asian holdings to Europe. Especially the safety and the resources of India and Indonesia remaining available for the British is a major change, strengthening the British war effort immensely. But we all know the biggest change, we have removed Pearl Harbor. Now this doesn't remove American sympathy for the Allies. Land lease would still be in full swing and Britain would still hold out to the last man with American aid. In Eastern Europe, the war in Russia would still slow down to a crawl for the Germans. But from this position, the war in Europe would become significantly slower, which can only mean one thing. A larger Soviet sphere at the end of the war. Even if we assume that the US, even without Pearl Harbor, does enter the war, this could be years later than in our timeline. But from the perspective of the US population, is entry into the war even necessary? By just providing land lease, Britain has won the air and naval war and the Soviets have stabilized the front. The US may very well decide to remain fully neutral in this timeline. 
The British may still win in Africa, especially without the Asian front, but a full-scale invasion of Italy, and especially northern France, is a lot more difficult. Britain likely focuses their effort on the southern Mediterranean, much like in our timeline, but they would mostly get bogged down by the Germans, while it's the Soviets that actually do the bulk of the fighting. Assuming the US doesn't ever join the war, we could very well see the Soviets march all the way up to the Rhine at least. And even if the US does eventually join, their delay could still result in a significantly smaller Western bloc in Europe. Either way, the removal of Pearl Harbor has resulted in a smaller West and a stronger East. But let's not dwell on Europe too long. There are enough Europe-focused alternate histories. The biggest change for Asia is that there wasn't a war, obviously. Perhaps the Japanese even sided with the Allies, at least officially, doing some minor fighting at sea against the Axis, but for all intents and purposes, World War II was a European affair. The main change in this timeline would be the lack of the occupation of the European colonies. Japan's short three-year reign over Asia radically transformed the continent. It showed the colonies that the Europeans could be defeated. It removed European soldiers and administrators from power, while placing locals into these positions. Following the end of the war, within a decade, most European colonies fell. India in 1947, Burma in 1948, the Philippines in 1946, Indonesia in 1950, and Indochina in 1954. Only the colonies of British Malaya and Papua New Guinea lasted longer than a decade after the end of the war. This makes the decolonization of Asia nearly 15 years earlier than that of Africa, a significant difference. And while I do still believe that decolonization would be the norm after the war, we can expect it to take far longer. Especially the French and the Dutch were set on remaining in their colonies. The exception is India, which would still receive independence, as it's simply too big to keep control over. Or at least, the British were now too broke to even try. Besides, the Indians had been promised independence thanks to their great contributions during both world wars for the British side. The Philippines are also an interesting case. The US left them immediately after the war, since they didn't really want to pay for the reconstruction of their colony. In this alternate timeline, America could very well remain much longer. The very politics of the Asian nations are also all radically changed, as figures like Sukarno, who came into power due to the Japanese, or Ho Chi Minh, who came into power after revolution, now have a much, much harder time gaining power, radically changing the politics and history of most Asian states in ways I cannot even begin to explain. One interesting region to watch is Indonesia, which would absolutely be too big for the Dutch to keep control over long term, could very well be split upon independence, with an eastern Moluccan state being split off from the rest of Indonesia. Over in China, there is no way in hell that the communists take control over the nation. The nationalists weren't very popular, but the communists were just some remote army hiding out in the mountains. The Japanese invasion also discredited the nationalists massively, since the nationalists flooded their own lands, retreated from their own capital, etc. etc., while the communists were much, much more effective, growing both their popularity and control over territory in northern China during the war. In this alternate timeline, China remains a battleground of interests, which the Soviets, Japanese, and Americans are all watching with great interest. How exactly it happens is difficult to say, but there is absolutely no way that Japan could stand for a communist China. And while they wouldn't be enthusiastic about a strong, unified, nationalist China either, it's preferable to the communists. And eventually, through US and Japanese help, the nationalists would likely come into control over most of China. This would massively restrict the Soviet Union's capability to extend their power into Asia. But while this alternate China would be a part of the anti-communist world, that doesn't mean that they automatically integrate into the Western world. The leader of the nationalists was an autocrat hostile to Western domination over China. While ideologically opposed to the Soviets, they wouldn't be best buds with the West either, especially considering Chinese desires to reclaim Taiwan and even Korea from the Japanese as part of their nationalistic revival. Which leads us to an alternate Japan, which despite being a democracy, is still a nationalistic and a militaristic state to some extent. But especially in regards to the treatment of their colonies, while having a large army to bolster their role as the bulwark of democracy in Asia. Taiwan, better known at the time as Formosa, had a small population of around 1 million people, and I could see it being integrated as a full part of Japan eventually. Korea, however, is a different story. 
Their population is way too large to integrate, but just leaving the territory is also not an enviable situation, as it would place it under threat of Soviet actions. In the first couple of decades, Japan attempts to force control over Korea, only to see rising anti-Japanese and pro-communist sentiment rising in their colony, leading to Japan having the same realization as most European empires at the time. We can't hold on to this territory forever. Due to Korea's important location against the Soviets and the Chinese, I expect them to receive independence, but with some restrictions, as Japan continues to hold military and economic sway over the new nation. On the world stage, America and the Soviets would likely still engage in a conflict of some kind, but within this conflict, US-Japanese relations are completely different. While united against the Soviets, and both being democratic, they are much more competitive than in our timeline. Japan is still a major military force, likely only smaller than the US and the Soviets. I very much doubt that the Japanese would welcome American forces, as Japan sees itself as the first line of defense against communism creeping into Asia. In this alternate world, Japan's economy would also take a very large hit. Government spending on the military, less deep relations with their main partner, the US, and the lack of radical government and economic restructuring following World War II would lead to a completely different and economically weaker Japan. But that's the state that I will leave this world in. A militarized, democratic Japan on the forefront of the Cold War in Asia, a significantly smaller and weaker communist world almost completely focused on Europe, an autocratic and traditionalist China, this Cold War is almost completely unrecognizable to our own. But that's where I'll end this video. Thank you all for watching, consider leaving a like and a comment to support the content, subscribe for two more videos every single week. To continue watching, click on one of the two videos on screen now. Again, thank you all for watching and goodbye.